Dante is once again involved. And what's here primary is not just no longer the question of immortality of souls, but how <coughs> the political aspect, the political implications of this kind of belief, the political implications of this sort of belief, not believing in the immortality of the soul, how is this refracted onto the political scene, as it were? Uh, and again, uh, therefore, this is almost a platonic conceit, the relationship now between no longer body and city, as we saw in Inferno 6, but here, soul and city. Is this, is this a soulless city? Uh, what happens? How, how do we experience? How livable, which is, obviously, I mean, it's also a pun, how livable is this kind of city? Uh, what happens? In, what, is the, what, is, what are the relationship? What is the relationship between uh, various figures? Because what Dante singles out are two people, one a wealth and one a ghibelline. We are in the middle of the civil war of Florence once again. Uh, it's going to be Parinata, a, a ghibelline, and, uh, and the Cavalcanti, the father, the old man. Uh, who is a wealth. By the way, they're also related to each other because Cavalcanti's son, Dante's best friend, you remember he dedicates his Vita Nuova to him. He calls him my first friend, Guido Cavalcanti, had married the daughter of Farinata. They stand there in their tombs, ignoring each other, and each ignoring the pains, worries, perplexities of the other. It's a little picture of what we would call any city. This is the city in the beyond where everybody's squabbling, nobody's paying attention to anybody else, and everybody believes that one's own passion, one's own concern is really uh, paramount and foremost. There's nothing that can come, equal, can come near to it. So it's all, it's a canto that, is, interestingly enough, is marked by uh, interruptions. Uh, one is speaking, the other one says, forget it, I gotta talk now, it's my turn. And so it is, it is, the, it is a little vignette of Florence in the year 1300, probably, or later, but 1300 is a good date for, for us. So he's interrupted, Virgil and Dante are interrupted by someone who says, or Tuscan, who makes thy way alive through the city of fire and speaks so modestly, may it please thee to stop at this point, thy tongue shows the in, uh, native and noble fatherland to which I was perhaps, I like that, perhaps, too harsh. Suddenly the sound issued from one of the chests and so on. So they go on, uh, 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 turn around, what ails thee, says uh, uh, Virgil, see there Farinata, who has risen erect from the middle up, thou shall see his full height. He appears from the navel up in the tomb. And now a little historical detail. Uh, there used to be, in Rome, this church is still there, but it was already there in the year 1300 when Dante went on uh, an embassy to Rome, the church so-called of the Holy Cross in Jerusalem, which according to the legend was built with material, with stones from Jerusalem that had been brought to Rome by Constantine's mother, Helena. In the, uh, in the basement of that church, which would be opened only once a year around the Easter season, there would be a mosaic showing, and you can answer with only, only on Good Friday that, that, uh, the, the, uh, that basement would be open. And that mosaic, it's no longer there. It's no longer there, so I cannot, I'm not encouraging tourism, it's just I'm giving you a little, uh, little detail. There used to be a mosaic of the uh, rising Christ from shown from the navel up. And it's clear here that the representation of Farinata from the showing himself from the navel up is meant as a caricature of the belief in the resurrection. There are two, this is really the story of a man who doesn't believe in the resurrection, and iconographically, Dante will go on in focusing, insisting on this, uh, on the counter. Now, if this man doesn't believe in the resurrection, there is a po another possibility of uh, looking at it, so that there is a, uh, the description uh, is deliberate, it's clearly meant to evoke all of that. So the, there is a great exchange between them, who defeated whom, the two, the continuous battles between Welfs and Ghibellines, and Dante claims that his own uh, family managed to uh, take good revenge 
when the time came, and clearly the implication is that more revenge uh, since Dante has been, uh, uh, will, will, uh, will be necessary. They're interrupted by, uh, they're interrupted by this, the sight of, uh, uh, by the old man uh, uh, Cavalcanti. Uh, so you look at what the, what the story of the canto is. Farinata worries about his ancestors. Cavalcanti worries about his son. So these are Epicureans who have a sense of continuity somehow, a sense of dynastic continuity, all within the imminence of personal concerns and family. So they, go, they move beyond the, the fragmentations of self from the others. They seem to, to have a kind of extended idea of themselves in spite of themselves, in spite of their beliefs.